My name is Carol Pear. My date of birth is April 22, 1949. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and lived there till the age of 12. Uh, and this interview is for the Prairie Grove Oral History Project, and we want to be sure that we have your permission to reuse the interview. Yes, you do. Thank you. Uh, tell me about your parents and who were your parents? My parents were Bob and Marjorie Payne. Um, my dad was an assistant sales manager for what is now called Bal Baldor Electric, except it's defunct. It was bought out. Um, he worked for them for 39 and a half years. And when I was 12 years old, he was transferred from the St. Louis office to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Okay. Tell me about how you ended up in Prairie Grove. I lived in Fort Smith for about 10 years. Went to the University of Arkansas for a couple of years and then uh, moved back home and didn't complete college. I uh, worked for my dad at Baldor Electric and I dated my husband, Murphy Pear, who joined the Naval Reserve, did a year of active and then we married, lived in California for a year. And his uncle Jack Metters, who owned J&B Auto in Prairie Grove, wanted Murphy to come and work for him. So that's why we moved to Prairie Grove in 1972. Tell me about your earliest memories of Prairie Grove. I was a little taken aback when we moved to Prairie Grove because I had been here a time or two uh, before we moved to California when he was in the Navy. And um, when Uncle Jack asked us to move here, Murphy said, oh, the population's five or 6,000. There's a hospital in Prairie Grove. It's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good sized place. And when we pulled into town, the population sign was something in the neighborhood of 1,270 people. So I asked him where the other four or 5,000 went and he couldn't answer that question. Um, the Elizabeth Hospital, which had been in operation here for a number of years, had closed by the time we moved here. That was November of 1972, and we never left. Okay. Uh, what were some of the businesses in town in Prairie Grove whenever you moved here? Um, J.G. Ward had an auto parts store in Prairie Grove. Um, the uh, IGA store was still operative down on Main Street or Buchanan Street. The Southern Mercantile was open with Florence. And we learned early on that if you needed something and Flo didn't have it, then you didn't really need it. It, it was a great place to go and shop. Very interesting because there were ladies that would quilt upstairs at the Southern Mercantile when we first moved here. And that continued for a number of years. I don't know how long before that quit, but there was a group that would quilt upstairs at the Southern. That was, um, I don't really remember the ladies that were involved because I was not involved much in quilting at the time, but I, I did find it intriguing that that hand quilting was still an art that was being carried on on a regular basis. Um, the Crescent Department Store was there. Elton Skelton was one of the very first people that we met when we moved to Prairie Grove. And he, w he was very influential for us. He, he really welcomed us to Prairie Grove and, and uh, did everything that he could to make us feel good about being here. The Farmers Merchants Bank was in operation and uh, Murphy's Uncle Jack Metters had already talked to Wilford Thompson about getting me a job at the bank um, before I even got to Prairie Grove. I, I pretty much had an interview lined up with Wilford. Um, in my interview, he made me type part of a legal description to see if I could type, and I'd never even seen a legal description. I was 23 years old, and I'd worked in, a, in an electric motor company sales office for the most part before I got here. So a legal description with part of the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter of section 32 west in township whatever, that was just totally Greek. And it was the only one I, I ever typed in the six years that I worked at the Farmers Merchants Bank. Um, of course, Uncle Jack had J&B Auto. Um, there, there was, um, 
I can't remember who all was in business at that time. The, the IGA store, there were two, actually two grocery stores down on Buchanan Street. The IGA and then Guy Sparks uh, and uh, Kenny Bartholomew had the other one. Uh, tell me about what you did at the bank. When I first started at the bank, I was a bookkeeper. And I, it was a double entry posting system with enormous machines with full keyboards with all these numbers and uh, all of the accounts were posted by signature because in 1972 there w were no account numbers there uh, there was no maker encoding on the well there was maker encoding but only of amounts um, so I, I was a bookkeeper and I did that for probably nine months and then I was trained to run a proof machine and I did that for the rest of the time that I worked at the bank. I, I worked there for a little over six years, and then I got an opportunity to go to work for a CPA. And that CPA bought out the practice of a CPA who was also serving as the city recorder treasurer and doing the books for the city. So in conjunction with uh, getting the job for the CPA, in 19, that was in 1979, uh, I got appointed to be city recorder treasurer because the CPA that I was working for did not live in the city of Prairie Grove, so he could not have that title. And the city split the amount that they had been paying the previous recorder treasurer between me and my boss, Dan Pryor, and I got $50 a month and Dan got 300 and then I've stayed uh, recorder treasurer, which later changed to clerk treasurer um, for almost 34 years. Uh, when did that finally change where you actually got the pay instead of uh, Dan Pryor? It never did. It, the, the arrangement continued the entire time that I worked for Dan. I worked full time for him and part of my job was doing the books for the city. So I got a nominal salary, uh, which got raised uh, from $50 to $60 at one time uh, after about eight years. I don't remember what year that was. And then, and then at some point it went to 75 or 80. It was a, kind of a pain to get a raise because it required in, enacting an ordinance, which the council would have to approve. So and then shortly before I retired, there was, uh, they split the uh, positions of clerk and treasurer and changed the salaries. And the last few months that I worked, I got paid $150 a month because they had split to pay the clerk one amount and the treasurer another amount. And it totaled 150 and I was doing both jobs. So I got that, I got that big raise at the end after almost 34 years. <laughs> so who was the clerk before you? The clerk before me, or, or recorder treasurer before me, was Carl Burris. He was um, a, a CPA. He was a volunteer fireman here in Prairie Grove, and he and his wife Sarah had a couple little children. Carl got an opportunity to join a CPA firm in Texas, and he sold his practice to Dan Pryor, and when Carl sold the practice to Dan, he asked Dan if he knew anybody that could run the office for him here in Prairie Grove, and Carl gave him my name. And I set up an interview, and I decided to jump in with both feet and left the bank, where I could have had stability, but I didn't see really room for advancement. I worked with great people at the Farmers Merchants Bank. They were wonderful people. You know, I, I still see a lot of them, uh, love them, they were great. But for a woman in banking in the 1970s, there just didn't seem to be much future for advancement. I had taken uh, some accounting classes and I was still running a proof machine after six years and uh, all I was, I, I got to cross foot an expense journal occasionally, but that seemed like very little uh, awareness of the fact that I had had more skills than just running a machine. 
Tell me about your time with the city and in the early days, some of the stories you remember, because didn't you sit in on all the council meetings? As recorder treasurer, part of my job was taking the minutes at the council meetings. So I attended virtually every council meeting for almost 34 years, with the exception of, of you know, missing an occasional one when I was either sick or uh, had a baby at one point, and really attended a council meeting when she was three weeks old. I, uh, so, yeah, I was in on an awful lot of meetings <laughs> and, and then wrote up the minutes. And I think maybe I tended to be a little too wordy in the minutes, but uh, I tried to keep a, a good, honest account of, of everything that was said and by whom it was said at the meetings. I think it was important for the history of Prairie Grove for it to get recorded accurately. Tell some of the stories you remember kind of from when you started and coming forward of kind of the history of the city. Well, when I first started, there were so few employees that payroll was certainly a very simple thing to do. We had we had a, a chief of police and and about three officers, I think, and and a, two sanitation department people and two in the street department and and a couple in the in the court or maybe just one court clerk. So uh, payroll really didn't amount to much of a chore. And the growth of the city is one of the things that has impressed me the most. I also I was also uh, pleased to see how willing the people of Prairie Grove were to take on additional sales tax responsibilities in order to provide things for the city that the citizens seem to want. From very early on, any time there was a poll taken, questionnaire sent out, what would you like to see in Prairie Grove? One of the big things was always, we want a swimming pool. We want a swimming pool. So there came a time that a sales tax was passed so that we could get that swimming pool. And it's been open now for 12, more than 12 years because my daughter's almost 33 and she was a lifeguard there uh, when she was 16. So it's, and that was the second year the pool opened. So the pool's been open going on 20 years now. And, and it's a tremendous asset for the city of Prairie Grove. Um, I also remember the time that the, the council had to increase water rates by 36 or 37 percent. And that was, that brought about the largest attendance at a city council meeting that I believe we'd ever had. Because nobody wanted to see their water rates go up by that amount. And we didn't want it to happen either. The council, I say we, was, I'm not a part of the council, or wasn't, had no vote, but we didn't want to do that. Um, it was painful, but it was necessary because um, we had not put enough money back into the depreciation funds and enough money to pay bond debt service. And it was just a necessary evil that we take this huge hit on uh, water rates. And they've, it, they implemented a policy after that of having a, a two or three percent increase uh, every other year or so, so that we were able to keep up better with the sinking funds and depreciation funds and, and, and have the money on reserve so that uh, we could take on a lot of the, the maintenance and repair projects that uh, we didn't have to pass bond issues to do some big things. We did some bigger things with money that was on hand rather than running short and then ha having to borrow money and go into debt more. About what year was that whenever you raised the rates and was there any specific reason oh. or just general maintenance? The main reason that, that they did it was that they had gone on for a number of years without having a rate increase. I mean, when we first moved to Prairie Grove in 1972, we were living uh, on Jenkins Road and we actually were not on city sewer at that time. We paid a city water bill but had a septic system in the house that we rented, and we were only there for about six months, but our water bill was $6. And it stayed at a very low rate for a long time. I, 
but I don't remember how many, I don't remember what year it was that we had to do the, I'm sure Larry Ulrich could tell you when they had the giant rate increase because Larry was the water and sewer superintendent at that point. But um, they had just not, not managed to keep up with uh, really watching the money as well and paying attention. I, I guess it was it was just kind of slipped through the cracks that it was, and then all of a sudden, uh, Larry realized and and made it very aware to the council that we cannot continue at this rate. We've got to raise these water rates so that we can not use up all of our depreciation money. There, there's a certain amount that that this, the water department is required to set aside based on bond issues and how much debt service they have. There is a certain amount that has to go into a depreciation fund every year. And, and that was being done, but there just wasn't enough savings going on too. And it, I know it, some people think it looks bad if, if the city has a lot of money lying around on hand that you shouldn't be just accumulating funds, but things happen, nature happens. Um, I rem remember a time that there was a, a giant water leak that it, it took a long time to find it and the water department was losing a lot of water and they went around town with sound detecting equipment to try to locate the source of this water leak and when they finally found it and, and dug up the street it was like all water, just water underneath the pavement and like a but like a swimming swimming uh, swimming pool. There was our swimming pool right there. You could it was, but you didn't see it. It wasn't surfacing. It wasn't it wasn't bubbling to the top where it was a visible water leak. It took some special equipment to find it. Uh, what about the city's? Tell me about the city's decision to to go on the two ton water. How, how did that? I, I think it was a good decision. Um, the Prairie Grove Lake has been a good water supply source, and that that was that happened in like early '70s or late '60s that the Prairie Grove Lake was dammed, and that went on and went on online, and um, it's been a good source of water. But as the city grew, the ability to uh, fight a major fire um, it could it could have been really restricted. Uh, Words not coming. You need that we needed capacity. better better water capacity in case that there were a, a major fire, uh, like downtown. The the all those buildings on Buchanan Street downtown have firewalls to try to keep a fire from spreading through downtown. But they also have flat tar roofs too that uh, to where things could have spread. Yeah, we could have had a major disaster that required a lot of firefighting capability and without the addition of the two-ton water supply, you know, we could have been a, a, a real problem. Two-ton enabled us to keep the ISO rating, the insurance services organization or whoever that is, the state organization that, that rates cities and determines your uh, insurance ratings for homeowners insurance and, and business owners insurance. Because we added the two ton with more water capacity there, we've been able to keep the, the ISO rating for the city at a very, very low number, even lower than the city of Fayetteville. And, and that's partly because we don't have as much industry as the city of Fayetteville. But uh, for a small, what would be considered a small city, uh, Prairie Grove has a really good ISO rating, and Two Ton helped with that. Uh, tell me about the uh, different mayors you work for, and kind of about their personalities a little bit. I guess when I when I came on, JG Ward was the mayor, and JG and I got along just you know we we got along just fine. He was. Um, He's actually a cousin of, of somebody that I knew from high school in Fort Smith. So, um, but he was 
easy enough to get along with, for me anyway. I had a lot to learn at the beginning. Um, Boyce Davis was the city attorney, and he was an, a, an immense help to me. And that's, and he's not a mayor, but that I derailed. So um, after JG Minor Wallace, is that right? I think. <laughs> Uh, Minor Wallace was, was mayor briefly, um, and, and I, you know, I really, I really didn't have any trouble with any of the mayors. Andrew Bain was, was an excellent mayor, followed in his father's footsteps, serving as, as mayor of Prairie Grove. Calvin Bain, his father, had been the mayor um, in the 60s, 50s, 60s probably. Um, if there was anyone that I kind of butted heads with, I, I would have to admit that it was Eileen Manning. And she's she was a very smart woman. And um, it, but I think we were probably two strong personalities that that didn't quite see eye to eye on several measures. And uh, she wanted to just wanted me to be quiet and not have any input. And I felt that as an elected uh, official for the city of Prairie Grove, that there were some times that perhaps I should have some input into the council proceedings. And she preferred that I just stay quiet and take notes at the meetings. And I'm being very honest here. And, and you know, I, I think Eileen was really a very good person. She was so active in her church and in, and in the women's club. She, I think, kept the women's club in Prairie Grove going for many, many years. And, and, but perhaps we were too much alike and, and uh, we, we tended to butt heads. Um, Sonny Hudson, <laughs> whom I finally refer to as Sonny Honey. He's, he, he's been a really good active mayor. He's been, I think, very good for the city of Prairie Grove and, and represents the city well. He's, he's served in leadership positions with the Arkansas Municipal League and, and, and really works hard at, at being a mayor, and I think that's good. Uh, tell me about Larry Ulrich. What, did, what about his role with the city? Larry um, is, I think, the heart and soul of the city administration. He knows virtually everything there is to know about the history of Prairie Grove. He could tell you where every water and sewer line is in the city. Um, I know that he makes people angry, <laughs> but you're not going to make everybody happy that it, it doesn't work. And if, and if it's working, if, it, if you're making everybody happy, you're, you're doing something wrong, I think, because um, he's, he's very forward thinking and has encouraged the council uh, like to, uh, when we did the major uh, new uh, waste treatment plant, that was a, a major project that the city undertook and, and almost, it almost didn't happen because a couple of the aldermen didn't want it to happen, and um, but we'd already committed to uh, a bond issue to make it happen. It, it, had that not happened, the growth that we're seeing, particularly right now, couldn't be happening because without that additional um, enlarged sewage treatment plant, we could not have all the new construction that we have in Prairie Grove right now. The Sundowner subdivision has has gone crazy. When it when it was first uh, platted uh, between Sundowner and Bell Bell Meadows or Bell whatever, uh, all the different new newer subdivisions that that were platted in the late 90s, early 2000s, all of those, uh, they couldn't, couldn't happen. They couldn't be filled up. And, and Sundowner is well on its way to, to being filled up. Uh, if you look at it now, it's much, much, much more occupied than it was when it first started. It got a very slow start. But uh, some of the aldermen did not want 
didn't think that current people should have to pay an increased water and sewer rate to pay for new construction for people that didn't already live here, that, that we shouldn't be paying. But I think it was important that we did pay for the growth because all of that new growth will uh, contribute a lot to the tax base of the city. There will be money that comes into the city from not just from the water and sewer rates that are paid by those new homes, but, but the taxes that, that they pay to the school and to the county. So um, Larry pushed for that. Larry Ulrich is, um, he knows what's going on and he, he sees the future very well, I think, to, to uh, try to keep us moving, moving in a positive direction. Um, and also he works hard at, at keeping staff lean I don't think that, that we are oversupplied with employees so that people are standing around doing nothing. There's, he, he's a, an excellent manager, in, in my opinion. He's just an excellent manager and he has many, many things to manage. Besides, he has water and sewer and sanitation and the, and the, the uh, parks and recreation, the, the swimming pool. He, basically everything except the police and courts. And, and Larry does it all. Uh, Prairie Grove has always been known as being a very progressive town, a neat, clean town, and uh, sometimes thought as forward thinking. Uh, do you have any response to that? Do you agree with that? Or I would agree that, that Prairie Grove is forward thinking, and, and a lot of that has, has to do with the way uh, the citizens have reacted when we have asked for an increase in sales tax. One of the things that, that the citizens did when they passed a sales tax to build a swimming pool was to also pass a quarter cent sales tax that is ongoing uh, for uh, parks and library operations. And that helps a whole lot to maintain uh, our, our pool, uh, Mock Park, the ball fields that have been built so that there are a lot of kids from Prairie Grove and from outlying areas, children that are in the Prairie Grove School District that play baseball and softball here all the time and the prices are kept relatively low. The admission prices at, at the pool are, are not onerous. That's, um, I think it's a forward-looking city, that, uh, and the library has expanded. We, Prairie Grove has the first freestanding children's library in the state of Arkansas, and part of that is we're able to do that because of this quarter-cent sales tax that the people adopted, knowing this quarter-cent never goes away. The, the three-quarter-cent that pay, or the one and three-quarter, whatever it was, that paid to build uh, an, an addition to the um, old library and to build the park, with the aquatic park, uh, that goes away when it's paid for. And I don't remember what year that is, that, that that's all paid for, but that, that sales tax will go away. But that quarter cent will stay. And a quarter cent doesn't sound like a whole lot. And it's not when you look at, at paying a quarter of a cent on a dollar. Um, but that adds up over time, and as Prairie Grove grows and more people pay that quarter cent sales tax, yeah, it's going to keep the, the pool and the, and the library operating for a long time. If someone asked you that you met who wasn't from Prairie Grove, said, tell me about the people of Prairie Grove. What are the people like? What would you, how would you describe them? Well, if you look at, at Prairie Grove's trash trucks. I don't know if they still do it, but at least back a number of years ago, uh, the sanitation trucks in Prairie Grove said, Prairie Grove, the friendly city. And I think when you're talking about the people of, of Prairie Grove, they are pretty friendly people. Um, when we moved here in 1972, it was, um, it was strange for us. We were, we'd only been married a year and, and uh, it took a while to meet people and make friends. Uh, a lot of the people in Prairie Grove have lived there all, all their lives and they've had the same bunch of friends since kindergarten or younger. So, you know, there's some 
I'm not saying cliques, you know, but but there are some groups that are that are kind of insular, but but they're all friendly, you know. They they don't just turn their nose up at you and act like they're any better than you are. That's I mean, Prairie Grove is, is home now. It's I mean after 45 years it ought to be. That's almost 45. So um, <laughs> my children, you know, we raised two children here. Um, Neither one of them wanted to stay here, but they didn't go very far. So um, the Prairie Grove schools are, are pretty good. They're maybe better now than they were when my kids were in school. That's, but um, my daughter's a nurse practitioner now. You know, she, she got, must have gotten some kind of education here because she went to Prairie Grove her whole life. And so did our son, and he's an, he's a self-employed tile contractor. So uh, both of our kids did all right for themselves after going through the Prairie Grove school system. Um, Prairie Grove's a good place. It's I would far rather raise a child in a city the size of Prairie Grove than a city the size of Fayetteville or Springdale. Uh, our granddaughter it technically should go to Fayetteville schools, but... Um, my son and daughter-in-law got her transferred into Farmington because they're very close to the Farmington limit and we do have school choice in Arkansas so she she's in Farmington which I think is is a better fit um, I, the people of Prairie Grove are hardworking and um, we'd like to see a little more participation in the Lions Club my husband's been in it for many years and uh, we need some younger people because we're not the young people anymore. <laughs> um, having the the uh, battlefield park here is a tremendous asset, and I uh, hope that the clothesline fair continues for many years. Uh, what other stories about Prairie Grove could you tell that I haven't thought to ask about? Um. Do you remember when the water tower fell? Tell me about that. Oh, yeah, I remember when the water tower fell. Um, I remember it pretty well because um, my son was, our, our son was six, and Murphy had taken Josh downtown to watch the water tower uh, be leveled. Uh, it's, uh, water tower is very close to my husband's place of business, which we didn't own it at the time, but... We, we did later, and uh, so Murphy kind of had a vested interest in, in being there when the water tower fell to see that it wasn't going to land on, on the shop where he worked. And Josh, I believe, was quite interested in the whole operation. It, it didn't go as planned, and I, I was at home, had just gotten out of the shower and was getting ready to blow dry my hair when the power went off. And... Uh, so I went downtown, when the power didn't come back on immediately, I went downtown to see what was going on. And it was a mess. It was, um, there was nothing funny about it. It was, you know, it really, um, well, it made national news, I guess, because it's not often that people pull a water tower over on on a whole row of city, bu of city buildings. You know, it was, <laughs> it, it was quite a, Spectacle. I guess maybe that's a good word to define it. Was it was a spectacle, and it got us some publicity, and not necessarily the kind that you want to get. 